Morning, Doug. Hello, how's it going? Doing well. Good. Yeah, one minute. It's taking a while to get everything organized. Uh, I'll be offline for the first few minutes. I just wanted to check in, but I'll be back here in a few minutes to watch the upcoming topics, which I'm excited right. about. Oh, cool, thank you. Cool, thanks. Hey, John. Hey, I'm really glad to have actually been able to do something positive this week. I did notice you were a little busy. That's good. Thank you. Well, it's it's a matter of I have something else to procrastinate against harder. Um, uh -huh. I think this is actually a cunning management technique from my manager you know, when he wants me to do the stuff that I've been procrastinating a, a, about on a medium level. He'll give me something that I want to procrastinate about more. So I do all the medium level stuff. I totally understand. Yes. Procrastination is a wonderful thing sometimes. Okay. All right. Meaning to procrastinate and then I don't get around to it. Yep. Hey, Remy. And yo, Tommy. Yo. Um, Lucas. Hey. Hello. <laughs> I can't put my finger on it, but something feels different about the Zoom. I can't, I can't, it just feels slightly off. I can't figure out what though. All right, let's see. Um, Scott. Doug, Doug, Doug. Hey, and Eric. Good morning. Morning. How? Hello. Hello. I think Zoom has been changing the way they display participants while you're screen sharing, if that's possibly what's been niggling you. Yeah, maybe that's what it is, because it does look like there's like, different colors or contrast or something looks slightly different and not not bad or good just different yeah yeah <laughs> seems like it's bigger or something or maybe it's just my eyes freaking out on me Whoa. <laughs> Doo -doo -doo -doo. i'm trying to think i don't think anybody on the call yet is in is from europe do they, do they do their time switch this weekend or next weekend? I can't remember. Uh, it was last weekend. I mean, oh, it's last the weekend. UK. Oh, you and, are okay. Uh, yeah, and Europe's the same as the UK. Okay. Was Good. that was that universal for all countries? I thought like some of them, like like Israel and whatnot, were like in like a weekend behind or something like that. Uh, Israel has all kinds of interesting things in terms of time zone. I can just check. So uh, I am a time zone nerd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I don't mean to kill the call on that, but it was, I was just curious. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. I'm so nerd. I don't think I've heard that phrase before. All right. Yeah, for some reason, I've decided to almost specialize in versioning and date and time stuff. You know, why would anyone do that? But hey, <laughs> it's interesting. You got to have a hobby, right? <clears throat> All right, let's see. Klaus, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Lance? I'm here. Excellent. And Daniela, is that how you pronounce it? Yes, that's correct. Thanks. Okay. Um, if you want, if you want to be associated with the company, you just go ahead and put the company name into the Zoom chat, and I'll make sure I add that to your name in the attendance tracker. You don't have to. You don't want to, but usually people do that. That way, uh, their company gets voting rights. Uh, okay. I think that's everybody so far. We got a small group today so far. Ah, oh, I assume that's JP Morgan, if I wanted to think about the long version of it. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, welcome. I think this is your first time in, right? Yes, actually, I just discovered this. Basically, I was looking for a cloud events, and I discovered this group. So yes, first time today. Excellent. Well, welcome. And Vlad, I got you. Uh, Manuel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. All right. Small group today, but well, let's go ahead and get started since it is three after. 
Um, although we don't have Slinky yet, and I was going to lean on him because a lot of his issues are coming up. So we'll, let's go ahead and dive right into it. Um, so John, thank you for taking care of some of your AIs. Appreciate that. Uh, community time. Anything from the community people would like to bring up that's not on the agenda? All right, not hearing anything. Um, just let you know, we do have a discovery interrupt call after this one. Um, I don't think there's anything on the agenda as of right now, so I added one, which was just a nagging thing saying, okay, we said we were gonna start testing at the end of March. Well, it's no longer March, so we need to find out where we are relative to interrupt testing. So please join that if you're planning on doing some interrupt testing so we can find out everybody's status, okay? Uh, KubeCon EU, they did send out a note um, asking us to sign up for our sessions for the, um, what's called the office hours. Um, I did pick uh, late times in the day um, for Wednesday and Thursday. Please let me know if you're able to make those times and we'll start adding people's names there. Um, there's nothing for you need to do in advance. It's just basically show up and answer questions that people might have if, if they decide to stop by our booth and ask questions. Um, and that's about it. If we don't get anybody to sign up, then obviously we'll start nagging people, but it'd be great if, if people can you know, volunteer on their own to, to do that. I figured maybe two people would be good for the session. One person can't handle it because I don't think we get a, too much traffic, but it'd still be nice to have at least one person there for backup. Um, Tim, or I don't see him on the call. Um, I was talking with him earlier today. He didn't mention anything to bring up for workflow status. So I assume he doesn't have anything new beyond last week. So we can keep moving forward. All right, anything else relative to you know, any topic before we start jumping into PRs and issues? Uh, we, you can add the link I gave you yesterday for the slides, so if people uh, want to have a look. Yes, mm. hold on, let me do that right now, otherwise I'll forget, hold on. Like, I'm representing this whole group, so like, don't hesitate to do any comments, uh, <laughs> because I don't want to misrepresent you. <laughs> so. Okay. So we might refresh my memory. Is when is the deadline for sending Monday? Videos? It's Monday. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I can need to start recording probably tomorrow. Um, I have like a few things. Uh, I just added like a slide this morning. I woke up with what I thought was a good idea. <laughs> okay. So yeah. let's put a comment in here. Please get your comments to Remy by the end of day today um, because he'll be recording tomorrow. And like for Europe, that means tomorrow is fine because okay. like, I, I'm in California. So basically I do the recording tomorrow. So unless you work until really too late on a Friday night. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, does anybody have any questions if they've already looked at it for Remy while we're just going through the agenda? Okay, not hearing any. Let's go ahead and jump into the real work items then. Lance, you're up first. What would you like to do with this issue? Because I, I kind of got the impression that maybe it's sort of faltering yeah. a little. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I commented just before the meeting, I, let's close it. I, it. It's doing nothing more than just adding confusion. Okay. Um, what do other people think? Any objections to closing? Let me just double check it, but I suspect I'll be happy for it to be closed. Yeah, just to remind everybody, this is not changing the specification. This is just the primer. And we're looking to provide additional guidance, but as Lance said, it may actually confuse people more. Um, and so maybe it would be better to wait until we had another concrete example to leverage that we wanted it to, to focus in on instead of one that ended up being sort of a, a bad example. Is that a fair way to phrase it, Lance? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll give everybody a second to think about it. Yep. Yeah, I'm plus one on closing. Okay. Um, but I'm bummed. closing, but not forgetting. <laughs> there you go. Hold on. My mouse is acting up. Good golly. What is going on here? Okay. So no objection. Um, hold on. Okay. No objection to closing. Cool, okay, excellent. In that case, let's do this. Um, John, you mentioned you had to leave early. So why don't mm -hmm. we head, go ahead and look at your first, your, your two issues. That way you can explain them to the group and get people to start thinking about that and then you can vanish on us. That's much appreciated, thank you. 
Yep. So we discussed this, uh, I think, three weeks ago. Um, and Daniel Azuma and I had some discussions internally. And the result is this PR. Basically, uh, it just lays everything out really explicitly um, so that for percent encoding, you don't even need to refer to RFC 3986 uh, because it's very specific about you must encode these characters, you must be able to decode things that have been encoded unnecessarily, etc. cetera, um, but it's still entirely compatible with RFC 3986 as far as I'm aware. And someone who's smarter than I am about that RFC, please have a look. Um, for the second part of the encoding, so RFC 7230, it's a sort of interesting reference because it's non-normative. It's kind of some fields, maybe some header values may be defined in this particular way that uses double quoting. Um, so what I've suggested is that the percent encoding that we that we require SDKs to perform um, will uh will avoid any double quoting by encoding space and double quote and percent themselves um however because you know, this is only happening now and cloud events have been out for a while it wouldn't entirely surprise me if there are um existing implementations that do double quoting so any implementation parsing an http message should handle double quoting um, but I've said do not have to handle comments because I don't think we expect any header fields to include comments within the attribute um, that aren't, you know, if something's got its own comment format within the attribute value, fine, but no header comments, um, which frankly I've never seen in HTTP anyway. Um, that's the sort of TLDR of it. Uh, I've gone into specifics about it's UTF-8, uh, you must handle surrogate pairs or non, um, uh, lost, the, lost the plot, uh, non-BMP <laughs> characters in this particular way. Uh, you must reject things that have encoded uh, surrogate pairs as two separate UTF-16 code points. Um, I think I've been reasonably exhaustive, uh, but it's very easy to think that when not doing so. So particularly anyone who knows a load about Unicode, please let me know, especially if I've misused the uh, the characters, um, sorry, the, the terms. I have a C-sharp unmerged pull request that implements this. There was a hope that we'd be able to say, ah, we can use existing libraries. In .NET, I don't think there's an existing library that we could use to do just percent D encoding, because for the encoding, you'd need to say, I really want you to encode these things, in particular, um, uh, double quote and space. And for decoding, it tends to be within URL decoding, which will also decode plus as a space. And I don't think we want to get as far as saying that HTTP headers are kind of URLs when they're not. Um, so I'm quite happy for the C sharp code to be used as sample code. Um, it is, it's larger than we might like, but frankly, a few hundred lines um, once per language, I think is kind of reasonable. Okay. End of sales pitch. <laughs> All right. A quick question for you before you open it up to the floor. Is it your is it your assumption that what you wrote here from, um, it, sorry, I'm fumbling over my words. Is it your assumption that you did not change the desired semantics of what we were trying to do, even though I know it's technically a change from what's there today? Um, is this, do you think this is in line with, with what we intended to mean in the original spec? Uh, if I had found it clear what was intended, I possibly wouldn't have raised the issue. Um, I, I think there will be subtle differences in terms of I'm requiring a few particular characters to be percent encoded. So my guess is that existing implementations may well not percent encode spaces. A bunch of implementations won't then double quote uh, context attributes that start with a space. So that space will be 
lost in many cases. So I think it's strictly better than um, and when and compatible with in terms of it won't start losing information that was previously not being lost already is my expectation. Okay. Okay. So I think it's then important that the, in particular, the SDK folks in the group uh, look at this very carefully to see what kind of impact does it have on their code, if any. Because I think that should help us decide, one, if we want to go this direction, and two, if this is actually a breaking change. And if so, do we want to do it now or not? You know, save it for later or that kind of thing. So it's big decisions in front of us. Okay. I'm, I'm in, under no illusions that this is about to be uh, you know, rubber stamped through. Yep. Um, I'm expecting quite a lot of discussion. Okay, so obviously uh, it's fairly large and need, need some reviews. So I'm not gonna even think about asking for any kind of approval today. However, does anybody have any immediate questions for John um, that they'd like to ask now before the group has a chance to actually look at it in more detail? Okay. I see there was a chat nope. comment of no quotes. I'm not quite sure. Is that as in we won't end up with double quotes in the HTTP header? In which case, yes, I agree. That was that was the desire so that we would encode them. So uh, it was hard to get it wrong, <laughs> as it were. OK, cool. All right, any other comments, chat or voice? Okay, not hearing any, then please everybody take your time to review it very carefully. Um, as I said, this could have big, big implications going forward, especially if it unintentionally does a breaking change that we didn't mean to. Yeah. Okay. And I think this may end up being one of those things where we can agree on it has this impact, but can't decide whether that's breaking a breaking change or not, because breaking change isn't so much a binary thing as we'd like it to be. Right, and and it, and we have had a situation in the past where we put something in the spec, and it just was not what we what we intended, and so technically it was a breaking change, but we're, we consider that to be more uh, in the typo category more than anything else because we did not mean it to be to come out the way it did, and so we we this may be in that category, so we'll have to see. And presumably, there's the technically breaking change, uh, you know, theoretically, if. If there's an SDK implementation that we're not aware of, then it might be a breaking change, but actually all the existing SDKs, it wouldn't be a breaking change that could influence as well as yep. influence us as well, presumably. Yes, agreed. Right. Okay. Uh, any other well, comments, well, questions? Uh, oh, go ahead, Saki. Yeah, uh, so, sorry I didn't raise the end, but it will be a breaking change because uh, one, one application built with the previous version of the SDK and the new version built with the new version of the SDK is going, they are not going to talk each other. I would right? hope that, um, so anything that already does percent decoding should be able to handle um, whatever the new SDK outputs. And the, uh, the new SDK parsing an HTTP message um, I would expect to be able to handle whatever the old SDK put out as well, because there's this business about you have to be able to parse double quoted stuff, but you should never produce double quoted stuff. Um, and it may well be you know, what's on the screen right now doesn't show all of that. It's a long PR, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, uh, so Slinky, please don't uh, misinterpret me saying, no, I don't think it's breaking in that sense as a, a genuine, I'm sure you're clearly wrong. Um, I suspect it's best to make concrete examples. If you put a concrete example in the PR saying, imagine an old SDK that does this and the new SDK does that, and this is the attribute value, et cetera. Um, I'm really, really happy to work through all kinds of things like that. My hope obviously is that it turns out it's not breaking, but it's only through actually prodding it that we'll find out. Do you have a, a set of, of existing uh, HTTP headers that may be influenced by this PR? And, and if so, maybe add that as a comment in here so people are very aware of at least the ones that are that you know about that may be impacted by this? I don't. I have um, a bunch of tests in the new implementation, um, but I don't have, um, we, would, we would need to collect samples from 
across multiple SDKs, I guess. Um, so if, if anyone else has examples, uh, maybe from their existing integration tests and things, that would be fantastic. And we can just validate as we go. Well, it's not so much a validation as much as, you know, something that looks like this before your change is now going to be parsed or put onto the wire like this, you know, in, in a different format. So, so people could Sorry, that's what, that. I, what I meant by validation, as in, you know, uh, this is what we would currently do and let's validate that it doesn't break. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. please feel free to dump loads of examples in the PR. Okay. Any questions or any other questions, comments? Okay, in that case, let's jump over to your other PR. Maybe give some background on this one to refresh people's memory what this one was about. Yeah, so we had a question actually in the C-sharp repo, um, co massively coincidentally, saying, how do we go about uh, versioning cloud events? What happens if I want to make a breaking change in the schema? What changes are breaking, et cetera? Um, and I gave my personal view, but uh, we agreed that it would be good to have something in the primer, moved it over into the spec repo. Uh, three weeks ago, we discussed it and um, I certainly went away with an impression of what the group expected to, or wanted to see in the primer. Um, whether I accurately remembered and then accurately expressed it is a different matter. Um, but the, the basic idea is this is only guidance, it's not requirement. Uh, it's saying that um, once you've published something with a particular cloud event type, then you probably shouldn't, unless it's clearly labeled as beta or you've got other documentation somewhere else saying stuff isn't stable yet, um, you shouldn't make breaking changes within a type. Um, feel free to version your types in any particular way. Um, data schema is more an informational thing. So just changing the data schema URI um, whilst breaking stuff isn't enough notice because you may well still have old um, consumers. Uh, I've said that it's it's generally nice if you could provide, um, if you're trying to change the schema, provide an old version and a new version at the same time and gradually deprecate the old type however you want. We have a hand up. Uh, Scott. I, th I think this is good language. But there's there's a, a few ways you could do versioning where like the schema could just be a partial schema that points to the version of the actual schema or something if that was encoded in your data payload, for example. Does that make sense? Like there's a lot of ways to do this. And I wonder if it's kind of a waste of effort on our side to even just pr prescribe how to do it. I think if I understood your suggestion correctly, um, I think there, there may well be some kind of cloud events that are handled very dynamically and will always be handled very dynamically and making breaking, effectively making breaking changes, but advertising that within the data or within the data schema is fine. But I suspect in most cases, if people expect JSON with a field called name, um, and you suddenly change that to title, then however you advertise that, they've still got code that ex that's expecting it to be called name and writing code that is extremely dynamic. Um, if they don't know that it's gonna be changing from name to title, how can they work out what to do with it? Um, I'm certainly happy to maybe have a few more options for versioning and pros and cons. Uh, but I, I suspect that if we don't provide any guidance, um, a lot of people will either not think about versioning at all, which I suspect is going to be fatal, um, or come up with a zillion different, not quite compatible ways of doing things. But do push back. Okay, yeah. Um, any other questions, comments? Obviously, I think people need time to, to look this over. Um, providing guidance is always interesting. Um, 
when it comes to uh, areas where you have lots of choices, right? You gotta be, you gotta be careful. So I think people need to think long and hard about this. There's one paragraph here that I would particularly like reviewed because I'm asserting something that everyone else in this working group will know much more about than me, uh, which is the paragraph starting, the data schema attribute is expected to be informational. I've kind of, that's my understanding, but I can't point to anything that says that. Um, it makes sense to me, but may well be completely wrong. So we may just want to strike that paragraph, edit it, etc. And those with more history in why things are designed that way um, may well uh, have a fit when they, when they see what I've written. Okay, more thinking they're needed. Any other questions, comments? All right, cool. Two uh, interesting PRs are going to require lots of thinking. <laughs> All right. Um, in that case, John, I think those are your only ones that were up for review. OK. They are. And thank you ever so much for uh, obliging me and doing those first. Sure. All right, in that case, let's go back to the top, start with the oldest one first. Slinky, this one is yours. I think last time you asked us not to merge it. I think you may have made some minor changes here, but is there anything you wanna draw people's attention to on this one before I ask if, uh, if there are comments or questions on it? Slinky, you there? Yeah, uh, well, for me, this is good to go. Okay. I, I've so, so, well, well, let me give some, let, let me provide some context on why I opened so much PRs. So <laughs> let's make it easier. So I went through this week and I implemented the whole language in Java, in the SDK Java, and there is an open PR for it. And it, and it, at least I checked this morning again, and it implements the full spec, including all the various testing rules, uh, uh, the operators, of course, uh, the old built-in functions, and so on. Uh, what I produced out of it is, so first I fixed the grammar, and the grammar now properly works, and I've tested it with, there are several tests, and it seems like it's working pretty fine. Um, then can you open uh, the list of PR? So, Oh, oh, you want to go? Yeah, oh, I'd like to go through all of this uh, very, very quickly. So then I found out some uh, minor things like uh, the division by zero can return a better default value. Uh, there are some things that are not very well clarified, like the in semantics, uh, the function overloading, the concat should accept the delimiter, and all the kind of small things. So I, I, I kept this splitted in order to avoid one giant PR that fixed all the different things. So if people is not, doesn't agree with some, some of the specifics, uh, we can discuss about it. So yeah, that's pretty much the thing. So general copy editing, at least in my opinion, can be merged if people is okay with it. So the, uh, there is an order for merging things. <laughs> yeah, so. We, we need to we need to merge the general copy editing first. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like I'm trying to figure out. Do you so do you do you not want to go through each PR today and let people look at them, or are, no, are you hoping can, to get them merged today? Go. No, no, we can go. We can go through all this because they are all small things. So some of these are obvious. So okay. Well, I'll tell you what, let's start with the first one. So on this one, mm -hmm. um, anybody have any comments or questions on the, the, the initial grammar one? Any objection to approving? Okay, so let's get that one out of the way first. All right, cool. Okay, so let's do Division by zero first, since that's your first one on your list. Oops. Okay, so before we jump into each one of these, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. I know that there are, I, based upon our previous conversations, it, it, it led me to believe that there is not a single SQL standard. There may be a 
common pattern out there, but there is no single SQL standard out there that everybody says, yes, this is the one and only one. There are slight variants out there. However, in your opinion, these changes that you're making here, like for example, how to deal with divide by zero, are the changes you're proposing here trying to follow what you think is the most common pattern or did you decide to pick a pattern that you thought made the most sense for cloud events? The latter. Okay. So, uh, well, for, for the in, so the in PR, uh, the, yeah, there is an, an open PR about clarif clarifying the in semantics. That one I took, uh, let, let's say I did so, uh, what made most sense for me, but it, it doesn't work the same as Oracle SQL. So I tried it on Oracle SQL and it doesn't work the same. Uh, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. Let's go one by one and, okay. and find out what people think about it. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and explain your logic on this one? Yeah, so, so this one, this one is basically so you know that the language uh, is is total, so it always uh, returns a value even if the uh, parameters are invalid. But if the if one of the parameters is invalid, it depends to the error list, the error. So in this case, when you uh, when you divide by zero, it makes far more sense to return uh, infinite, plus infinite and minus infinite more than returning zero. And in this case, plus infinite is the maximum value of in 32. So that's the change here. Okay. Any questions on this one? Because to me, the entire question of what to do with air, when you, when you run into some sort of air condition is an interesting one, right? Do you drop the events? Do you do something like you're doing here and pick a value for- So in the, in the implementation, in the implementation uh, when you execute evaluate, it returns uh, it returns a type that contains both the return value and the error list. If the error list is, is, is not empty, then it means that an error happened and things went right. bad. Right. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a list how I implement, uh, that's a list uh, implementation that I got. Right. And I think, doesn't Clemens have an action item or something to get back on his, with his thoughts around how to deal with errors or something like that. I thought he was gonna do some work on that, but never got around to it. Well, I, I think he was fine with the, with the way errors works. Uh, so uh, what to do with errors while filtering, that's a different thing. But oh, okay. Yeah, let's okay. not forget language doesn't, doesn't have anything. I mean, it's for filtering, but it's not only for filtering, so. Gotcha, you're right, I forgot, you're right. I forgot that, we, that you separated out the language from the filtering aspect, yeah. you're right, I forgot, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Any questions on this one from the group? You guys are awfully quiet today. So this was put out there six days ago. So technically it's within the time frame to get merged. Do people want more time to think about this <clears throat> or is everybody okay with going forward with it? Don't hesitate if you want more time. Uh for me, I don't understand how it can return and raise an error at the same time. But uh, that's maybe just me. Uh, I can I can show you the implementation, so it's easier to to understand at least at least what's my idea behind this. It may be wrong, but uh, I'll give you a link. Uh, uh, So Remy, are, are you suggesting that it makes more sense to you to either return a value or an error, but not both? Yeah, and like I'm not a big fan of taking max integer uh, because it represents infinity, but uh, what happens if we go to 64 bytes or I don't know, in 20 years in the 128 bytes? This might change, no? I don't know. I, but so that's... I don't uh, understand the full context probably, but it's just just that sentence as a programmer, I find it weird, but that's just my opinion. So on cases like this, Slinky, would it make sense to first get clarity and in, in a, in a concrete decision on how to deal with errors? Meaning 
are we going to are we going to stop processing on an error and only return an error, or are we going to return a value and an error? Because I think that's a pretty that, high level decision, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's that's well, that's that that was the that's the point of error. I mean, the, um, in case of an error, uh, we don't uh, mandate what to do. Okay, so the implementation can decide to do whatever it wants. So it can decide to to stop the execution. It can decide to continue the execution with the default value, or maybe there are some errors that are more important, some errors that are less important, okay? And we are not mandating anything around that. Then uh, a filtering implementation might decide, uh, or, may, or maybe the, 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 what's the name, the subscription spec might decide to say, hey, if there's an error, it just uh, uh, has to fail. And we are good, okay. But the language itself uh, is abstracting from this, and it's just saying uh, every function is total, so everything returns something. There may be, there might be the side effect of appending to the error list, but still there is a return value always. Yeah. So in my opinion, like I would prefer to say like we define when there is an error. That means the filtering is returning false completely. Like so, we ignore that event. And then officially it doesn't return anything because it raised an error. It's, I don't understand why we make mandatory to return a uh, value because I saw someone else putting a comment where I don't understand the value of having uh, like minus max integer compared to zero. And I must say that I'm with him on that one because like, obviously I don't really care. That's, Mathematically, it's uh, impossible to do that. So I don't even want to have anything further because it's going to start being uh, unpredictable. Like, obviously, my logic is wrong there. So it should just stop, in my opinion, because I'm doing a mistake. So, 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 so Slinky, you, you've talked about how this specification is not just for filtering. Can you remind the group in with the other cases that it's going to be used where it makes sense to return a value and an error at the same time? Well, for example, the first thing that comes to my mind is the ability to template some specific attributes. Uh, let's say I want to write uh, um, an expression that returns a, value, a string, for example, to set a specific attribute in the cloud event. Uh, in that particular case, for example, there, uh, wh when you access to a value and that value doesn't exist, it raises an error. Uh, but maybe in that case, this, that particular error can be just, we can just forget about it. So that's, that's an error that I can ignore. So that's a use case where I, can, uh, where I, where I might want to say, hey, there are some errors that I just want to ignore because I don't care about them. Or maybe there are some errors, or maybe I just want to, uh, maybe the, in the filtering, I always want to ignore errors. Or maybe there, again, there are some errors that might be not interesting, so we can ignore them. They're accessing, accessing a value is one of those errors where you, you might actually want to say, yeah, I don't care if there's an error when accessing a value because that value is not there. I can show you in it. Uh, I, I, I stumbled upon, uh, across this exact issue today uh, while I was testing one of the expressions from from the spec wording. So this one, this particular one. Uh, maybe you can open this one, uh, Doug. Uh, where, where do you want me to scroll to? Okay, this one, okay. Okay. Yeah, so this one is, uh, I'm checking if there is first name and then if there is uh, and last name are equal to my name and surname or if the, uh, there is a subject with name uh, with, with my name and surname um, when I when I try to address uh, an extension or an attribute that is not there I raise an error okay because of course I'm trying to access to something that doesn't exist but there is a default value defined for this which is um, which is empty string Okay, so when I try then to um, 
uh, if I try to evaluate uh, this uh, specific expression, uh, giving to it um, um, giving to it an event which doesn't contain first name and last name, this is this expression will fail, and uh, we, we, or better, will return uh, a value but it will raise an error saying, hey, you're trying to address first name, but first name is not there. So maybe you need to use exist to check if the thing is there first, okay? And so, so I can see how in a filtering system, this kind of error is an error that you want to ignore. While for example, in another, in another case, you may not want to, um, Avoid, uh, you, you don't want to ignore these errors, but you want to handle them some way. So <clears throat> this is an interesting scenario because I'm not sure I would have necessarily thought that anything on this line would have produced an error. Because I would have thought well, first name not being there would be like, okay, asking if it's nil kind of, it, kind of that kind of statement. There is no null concept because if you introduce null concept, it starts to be more complex. So there is no null, there is no null concept. And uh, it, this one doesn't raise an error. You see, it's, uh, the asset checks if it's not failed. But if you remove with extension the, the line uh, 108 and 107, this one fails because it returns an error saying, hey, you're trying to address first name, but first name is not in the event. Interesting. So, so Daniela, would you like to speak up to, to join the conversation? I know you're doing it in the chat, but I'd like to get your voice on record to to join the conversation? Uh, I was just trying to, uh, I know it's my first time here and I'm getting in the middle of the discussion, but uh, I think that by assigning a value in an error, uh, and if people suddenly decide, oh, let's ignore the error by mistake or by whatever reasons, they can start getting wrong conclusions. And I think zero seems to, at least for me, to be a more sensible default. And because you shouldn't be really ignoring the error of a division by zero. So it sounds like there were two different sort of comments in there. One is just concern about returning anything at all, as opposed to forcing people to actually acknowledge there's an error and, and take an explicit action. And if they choose to ignore it, that's their own business. But then in, in, this, in this specific case, you're saying zero makes more sense than max and min int. Right. Yeah, because people might take conclusions and think it's working as they were expecting, but actually they're having this silent type of error that they actually they're ignoring. So we can create all kinds of unpredictable behaviors because of this. Well, but we are raising an error. So it, it, we are not ignoring the error. We are raising an error and we are also returning the value. Yes, I, I personally would like a little more time to think about this one, not so much because of the value, although I do, I do, I do understand Daniela's comment there. Uh, you know, maybe zero makes more sense than max and min, and I, don't, I don't know about that one. I, I'm, I personally would like a little more time to think about the case of just returning a value at all, as opposed to only returning an error. Um, because I, I, my inclination is to say that if we always return a value, even if there is an error, then I think a lot of people are gonna just choose to ignore the error. And I understand then, then they're sort of hanging themselves and that's fine. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> they're, they're choosing to hang themselves and that's their choice obviously. But I think it, it's almost like it's encouraging people to do it in a sense, right? Whereas if you only return an error, then they can choose how they wanna handle the error processing, right? Maybe return zero or, or empty string or something in whatever case they have. Um, but at least then it's their explicit decision to make that choice. And we're not sort of encouraging them to do it in a, in a way. Um, maybe that's, that's, that's what I'm kind of worried about right now. So I'd like a little more time to think about it. Well, uh, I, I wanna add something. Uh, yeah. I, I would love to, to keep, um, I would love to do a distinction here. And the distinction between how the language works and how is then modeled in its interface, okay? So in its interface, it can just, uh, when there is an error, it can just always return an error and that's it and that's fine. I was planning to do that in, 
in, in the reference implementation too, having another interface that when there is, a, uh, there is a failure, there is a failure. That's it. So I think, um, I think um, um, it would be nice to keep this uh, error system uh, for giving the flexibility to the user to choose and to the implementer to choose whether it wants to implement or not the error system. Yeah, I could definitely appreciate that that point of view. Do, what do other uh, SQL languages do? Do do most of them return values and errors, or do most of them only return errors? How, how do they deal with it? Slinky, do you have any idea, or does I guess anybody else on the call as well? If you have experience, I'd like to. To know whether we're whether we're whether we're paving a new path here or whether this is well established for SQL to do. I can't say it's well established or not for the SQL to do, but for sure there are, there are a lot of errors and way to behave about errors that are very dependent on the implementations. So okay. Well Okay, I don't want to rat hole on this. I think we, I, I, I'd, I'd like to hold off on deciding this and at least personally, I'd like a little more time to review it. But before we move on to the next one, Manuel has a question for you. Uh, it may not be directly related to this, but he said, why can't there be a, the concept of a null? Well, to simplify things <laughs> in short, when you bring in the null concept, you, you start to have to deal with this, with things like uh, uh, null assertions, null checks and you know, all those kind of things. SQL has the notion of null in general though, doesn't it? It does it, it does, but um, I think it has a different purpose. Mm. So, you know, when like, for example, we, uh, it, it has the null type, okay? Well, for example, in the cloud event spec, there is no, no null type definition. There is no null concept in the cloud event spec itself. So why sh there should there should be in the expression language? Okay, uh, Daniela, did you want to say something? Because you kind of came off mute there for a sec. Uh, uh, just on the concept of no, no is kind of you're representing the absence of value in opposition to like a default or zero value. So uh, it's not really used for error rendering because here you you should have a value, but have like an exceptional route and. Uh, as far as you remember, like most of SQL uh, will throw an error in this case and not continue to process. Um. Okay. Well, like I said, I don't want to rat hole on this, but it was a good discussion. So please everybody think about this and let's move on to the next one. Um, hold on. Oh, zero, return any value. Let's take a look at this one. Yeah, I just want to add the last thing. If people yep. is uh, wanna, I mean, if you wanna reevaluate the errors, the way errors works, I'm completely open to it. So, I mean, if somebody has some concrete proposal, so please open it, and uh, I'll be more than more than happy than look at it. So, okay. yep, that's good. It's a shame that Clement isn't here because I think he had some strong opinions about error handling and stuff like that. So, okay, uh, would you like to talk to this one? Yeah, so this is this is a, not a small one actually. So this is uh, this is actually saying that the expression can return any type, any value inside the type system. And while the previous assertion was that uh, the expression is returning a boolean value, and this is very important for use the expression language outside filtering use cases. So when you for, for again going back to the previous example. Let's say workflow wants to use this expression language to template a specific attribute or, or a specific extension in the, in the event. This kind of uh, use case can be fulfilled only if the expression can return any value and not just bullets. Uh, but then I specify that when using in filter in the filtering predicate, of course, any output value either is, a, is already a Boolean value or has to be cast to a Boolean value. So when you cast something to a Boolean value, <clears throat> I'm assuming 
if its original value or its original type is a string, you'll actually do a string compare on the words true and false and make a decision whether it's Boolean based upon that, right? Yes, below there are all the custom rules are defaulted below, so. Right. Anybody have any questions on this one? I think this one was opened like six days ago as well. Or is it returning it six days ago? Yeah. Does anybody want more time to think about this one? If I don't hear anybody, I'm gonna ask for approval. Okay, any objection then to approving? Um, this one. All right, I'm not hearing any, it is done. Cool. All right, move forward two days ago. Okay, let's see this one. Would you like to talk to this one, Slinky? Yeah, so this one, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. So, uh, <laughs> Um, um, the, the problem here is very simple. In the implicit casting rules, uh, we talk about casting for the various operators, bi both unary and binary operators, and then for functions, but we don't really talk about like, exist, and in. So for like and exist, of course, it's, let's say it's natural. Uh, exist doesn't need any casting rule because of course it's just taking the the, the, the identifier of the event, uh, the event attribute. Well, uh, for like, uh, there is no need for implicit casting rules because the left argument has always to be a string. So everything has to be cast to a string. But for in, the, the problem is different. So for in, um, actually is not very, is not even very well defined, to be honest. So maybe the, uh, we have to reiterate on the in operator again. But the problem is that for in, uh, there is some need to, it, 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 we need to understand uh, if we need to cast, um, I mean, if all the um, elements of the set has to be cast to the left value type. So, this is more. This PR is more a question. The, the, does all the le, uh, all the elements of the set has to be cast to the left uh, to to, uh, to the type of the left argument? Do you require them to all be the same type to begin with? Uh, well, my my understanding was that we wanted to try different types. Maybe. Well, uh, well I. I and now that I'm looking at it, to be honest, I've implemented it in a different way. So, so yeah, maybe, maybe again, maybe we need to rate right over it. And yeah, I, I would love to understand what people think about it. Anybody want to jump in with a comment? Yeah, you can, yeah if, if, you, if you want, you can show how I implemented it here. So these are the test cases. Whoops, wrong window. Because this, I, 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 okay, right up front, I am not an SQL expert. It just seems like, for simplicity's sake, requiring all the Ys to be of the same type could only make things easier for people, both from an implementation well, perspective as well as a user perspective. Well, for in Oracle SQL, uh, everything is casted to the left uh, argument type. So they allow everything on the right hand side to be different? Yes. Interesting. That, that means then, they do have implicit casting. Yes, they do have implicit casting, which is the contrary of what I wrote here. So. Okay. So why did you remove implicit casting? Just curious. No, I didn't remove the implicit casting. It you... wasn't defined. No, it was it wasn't defined. That's that's the issue here. Wait, I'm sorry, but this line right here is removing implicit casting, right? Yes, yes, but it wasn't it wasn't really the again in Looking at reading the spec, I I I didn't really understood what was the the casting rule for the in, so that's why I opened this PR basically, because uh, it wasn't clear to me. So. Okay. Is yeah, we need some wording that that makes specific uh, how in behaves. I think. 
Is there something in particular here you wanted me to take a look at since you pasted this link into the chat? Yeah, that's that's the way now it works. So now it doesn't it's in uh, doesn't work only for strings, but it works for all the three types of the type system, and it doesn't allow implicit cast and it doesn't have implicit casting. So that's that's the way I implemented it. But yeah, again, I I think this requires a change. Anybody want to chime in? Okay, someone's speaking up. I personally would like a little more time on this one as well. In, in, in fact, I'd like to actually reach out to some of the SQL experts that I have within IBM to, to get their take on it, because I have no idea, to be honest, whether this is a great change or it's being too restrictive in some way or being too loose. I, I just have no clue. So I'd, I'd like a little more time to to think about this one. Yeah, that's 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 cool. Yeah, yeah. Please involve them. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime in before we look at the next one? We have maybe time for one more quick one. Mm -hmm. Okay, not hearing anybody speak up. We just did in, did John's. Let's do this one next. Uh, let's do let's do the seven uh, nine six because it's faster. This, this one? one is a lot. Yeah, okay. This one is just pretty simple. So yeah, yeah the concat uh, the concat function of course needs a delimiter as the first argument. Does concat in normal SQL have a delimiter? You know, I don't recall it. But I don't think I don't think it's a standard function. Let me check. Uh, Let me do a quick search too. Do, 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 do. No, it doesn't. Nope. Well, hold on. I found one. Oh, I found one on, on W3 schools. You, you can, yeah, me too. You can also concat with, with the plus. Concat w, oh, concat WS is to add separators. Oh, okay. So maybe there you go. Yeah, yeah. I can add another one. Um, yeah, hold on. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's what that's what I found too. So maybe that's maybe that's the way to go. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I'll, let's get started right here. Okay, cool. Okay, with that, I don't think we have time to dive deep into any others. So please take a look at the other ones. In particular, if if you know someone who has some SQL expertise, I think it'd be great to get their opinion on some of these changes. Um, because I because I, I get the general sense from the group that we'd like to try our best to um. Uh, to adhere to the most common use of SQL out there and not necessarily uh, to find something that, that has almost zero possibility of leveraging existing code. Um, okay, so with that, let's do this. Go back up here and do final roll call. Actually, let me ask, is there any other quick topic people would like to bring up outside of PRs and issues? Okay, in that case, uh, Daniel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I'm late. That's okay. Um, Matthew or Matt? Yes. I mean, okay. Grant, you still there? Yep. All right. And Doug M. Vanish. So I, did I miss anybody else for roll call? Hey, this is Jesse. Jesse, thank you. Anybody else? All right. In that case, cool. Okay. We're. I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Grant. I had uh, with other topics. Um, I was wondering for the CI uh, issue and comment you added, Doug, um, of using like conventional commits. Um, is everything okay there, or do you have any questions? Actually, I'm very glad you asked because I, I meant to bring this up and and I completely forgot. I think it'd be really useful if on the next on next week's call, if you could give a very short little uh, presentation or something to show what people need to do in their commits to use this stuff to get past the um, the uh, the checker. Because I think for most people, this yeah, is completely brand new. Yeah, so maybe give us the bare minimum that we have to do to, to get through the, the checks. Yeah, I can talk about it next week. That'd be great, thank you very much. All right, anything else? Okay, in that case, everybody's free to go, except for the folks who are interested in the interop stuff. We'll start that call in about a minute or so once people leave. All right. Thank you guys very much and have a good weekend.
Thanks. You too. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Actually, let me go to the bottom here, see who I get to pick on. Scott Venice, so I can't pick on him. Remy, you're still there, cool. Anish, we haven't seen Anish in a while. I wonder where he went to. And Manuel, cool. All right, let's see, are we done losing people? All right, Remy, since you're on, you came off mute, I'll pick on you. How you yeah. doing implementation wise? <laughs> Like my focus right now is Cube. <laughs> so after the video, I think it'll be better. But it was great uh, to work on the presentation uh, because I like basically I never really dig enough into the schema registry. And uh, so I had question around that too. I'm not sure it's complete because we are working more on the discovery and subscription. Mm -hmm. um, but like based on the data schema, uh, that for me potentially links to a schema registry or not. <laughs> uh, I was thinking of maybe just doing a small uh, schema registry, uh, like working schema registry uh, as well, because I, I think it can be done pretty quick. Uh, and then go back to the true development on what I was doing, because I, I know that I have some bugs that I need to fix uh as i told you doug like uh, my company just got bought so <laughs> i had a few uh, stuff uh, to do but i expect to have a little bit more time uh, in like in the next week to code on that and like really focus on that mm -hmm. but before that i really had to do the kubecon uh, video so i didn't okay. i picked uh, my battles and it was more on the presentation yep no, I understand. That makes sense. Okay. Um, in that case, continue through the list for myself. I haven't done a whole lot of changes since then. Um, I do think that what's out there today is at least workable for some interop testing. I don't have any of the other stuff like the pagination and, and stuff like that, but I do think I have at least a fair number of the features in there to at least do some basic interop testing. Um, but I do, I do have more to do. And I, like you, I've been very heavily focused on uh, some of the conferences that are coming up. IBM has a couple in the next month or so. So unfortunately that's taken up a lot of my time, but I am planning on finishing out at least to match some of the descriptions up here in terms of what we're supposed to be testing. Um, or at least I think what's out there today can at least do some testing. Okay. Uh, Manuel, how about your side? Oh, there we go. Uh, no update, mostly blocked by internal corporate stuff. Still looking forward to get a client going. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get it mostly code generated. And I think it's uh, okay for the discovery for subscription. I ran into that issue that uh, I don't have any public endpoints to, to get the AMQP delivery pointed to, but or HTTP callbacks actually. So I'm still positive that uh, <laughs> I, I can get some code running with the existing uh, discovery at least. And then for subscription, I think I have to wait. Okay. Um, I, I don't think we have anybody else. Is anybody else on the call who'd like to chime in who was thinking about doing some coding? Well, I was thinking about it, but I don't really find the time, unfortunately. Yeah. So let me ask a broader question. Um, I know everybody's been really busy and, and the coding stuff takes time, obviously. Um, and this probably is actually a better question asked of the full group, not just this interrupt group, but let me start here and just put an idea out there or a question out there. I, I do feel like we are moving kind of slowly, not just in the code, but on the specs as well. And I know most of us have just been kind of assuming that it's because you know, we're all very, very busy right now. And there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on, you know, work-wise as well as outside of work. Um, does anybody have any reason to believe that, <clears throat> that, there's, that this is a sign that maybe these specifications are not, <sighs> I have to pick my words right, are maybe not that critical? 
or is it just a matter of people finding time? Because one of the things I, one of the things I, 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 I'm worried about is, while we can look at these specs and say, yeah, we see there's value in here. Um, is there enough value to actually go forward with them though, right? Or is it just, yeah, it's interesting, right? Because I, with with cloud events. I'll be honest, it, it took me a little bit of time to completely see the value. Um, I, I mean, I was all in favor of it from the very beginning in the sense that it sounded like an interesting idea, but the value of it to customers really didn't sink home right away. It took some time for me to understand it better. But then once I did, I was like all on board with it. And I, I'll be honest with you, with these specs, I'm torn, right? I don't know whether this is just a matter of time and at some point a light bulb will go off in, our, in my head and say, yes, this, this, is, this is great. This is the next logical step. We definitely need this stuff. Or are we, are we trying to push on a rope here? So I'm trying to figure out. So Klaus, you came off mute. I'd love to hear your, yeah, your opinion. So, um, so I started a while ago um, and with this intention to, to do something for discovery and ran into quite a few things I'd like to bring up, but uh, just didn't find the time to do so. Um, I think it will get quite important for what Clemens and I am, are doing, but what I see at least uh, around where I'm working is that people are really still busy, well, how to phrase that, um, digesting <laughs> the, the pure cloud events spec. So uh, I don't know, for example, I spent probably really weeks of my life in discussions about what source is and, and, and things like this. So it's um, just that a lot of people are just not there. That's my perception at least. Okay. For me, I think the subscription and discovery seems really like, I don't see the system working without it because, but so I didn't have much time, but that's uh, one thing. And the other is like, that's my first time really uh, being in those kind of groups. And uh, like, I have like a huge respect for every one of you in this group. And sometimes I have the feeling that I'm kind of a fraud in that group, or <laughs> I don't know. So <laughs> it's kind of, uh, it's hard for me to push because I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure I understand fully what everybody else is trying to do. And uh, I'm still like, Usually on my project, like I can make decision and I'm sure because it's my decision. So I don't really care about the other people uh, opinions, which might be bad, I don't know. but in that specific, I'm like, wow, there is so many people who comes from like different backgrounds and like different contexts, like Clemens, like obviously at Asia, uh, it's probably not talking about the same uh, uh, size of uh, my uh, small uh, company <laughs> and and it's only a bit uh, intimidating for me to to try to drive some stuff because I'm like, maybe I'm completely wrong. I don't know. Okay. And so, so, no, well, so first of all, stop that. Okay. <laughs> Please. The, the, do not hesitate at all to speak up. I mean, you, you, you see, I mean, you've been in this group long enough. You know that so many people are quiet and it, I actually find it kind of frustrating, uh, to be honest. I, I wish more people would speak up because I want the interaction. Because even if people, if even if what you say is true, right? Where, okay, maybe you don't have much experience as someone like Clemens or something like that, that doesn't matter, right? Even as, as they say in school, right? There are no dumb questions, right? I, I have the same attitude here. Bringing up a topic that you either want to get clarity on or you think is the right way to go. And just even having the discussion is moving the ball forward to me. So don't hesitate to bring up anything at all, because if, if the worst case scenario is it will improve the spec to, to, to make it more understandable for other people that come after you. So don't, don't have that attitude, please, because we want to have more discussions around this. And if you, if there's a particular area that, that you want to help drive, even if you don't think you're the expert at it, sometimes just putting out an idea that even if it's a bad idea is a great way to go forward because that gets people thinking about it and talking about it. Yeah, I think I, I kind of miss also about that uh, COVID stuff. I, I think it would have been super great at one point, like let's say KubeCon, to just meet together, like have a beer, know each other. Like, <laughs> sorry if people don't like beer. Uh, it's kind of like, I'm from North of France. It's like beer country in North of France. <laughs> but uh, it's just to know each other and maybe like do some work session where we are like uh, whiteboard uh, IDs or just to make sure we're on the same page. So I'm probably old school there, but I think the 
now that I've been in the group for almost a year uh, and like tremendous uh, welcoming group, like I mean, I was amazed by that. Like, uh, really, congrats, uh, Doug, uh, because I think you really, uh, I'm really impressed with your skills on uh, how to manage the community, even if you don't have always uh, lots of feedback. But I, I think, yeah, it would have helped to just meet. Like, it's same thing for interop. Maybe if we would just be sitting in the same room for like a few hours. It would have been probably faster, uh, and with the time difference, it's hard to even do that with Zoom. But maybe we should do uh, those kind of work sessions sometimes if people are open to, to just say, okay, like you know what, we are on Zoom, but we could and we try each other's service. Might give more motivation or, or, yeah, find to find more time for everybody else. Yeah, no, I do agree maybe. with you it, that ha having a face-to-face. Um, not so much to meet everybody, although that obviously that would be nice, but having the face to face to have the whiteboard discussions to hash through some of these things in person would have been nice. I agree at some point. Um, and that's why we that's what we tried to do with I think those, you know, those marathon sessions that we had a few weeks ago to try to force through some of these discussions. Yeah. Um, and I think of having a having a well defined face to face event for the interop would have been a wonderful forcing function as well. Right, because mm -hmm. people don't want to show up and travel unless they have running code. So that really forced them to do it. It's, it's a little too easy to have other things take higher priority when you don't have a face-to-face -face meeting to go to. Um, but okay, so it, it sounds like people are saying it's just bad timing, bad situations. People are busy with other things. It's not so much the specs are are the wrong way to go. It's just it's just a, it's just. It's just bad timing for like better phrase is what i'm kind of hearing right yeah because like when i was doing the presentation like for me so i basically aggregate all the events possible in my company or trying to and like i'm so bored of like going and read the documentation of github and then uh, okta and then whatever other systems to try to understand how they do their webhooks what is their events what we should plug and thing like that. If I had like just a discovery endpoint where I can just uh, eat that and get uh, everything, I'd be like, yeah, cool. Like I don't have to to go through lots of documentation and my integration speed in my team to integrate other external system would increase uh, largely. And then I can, uh, that way I came up with like this idea of gateway or like aggregators, because then I can redispatch it inside my company and make the developer life of my company simpler saying okay like, you have our internal endpoints and you can get everything that happened in this company pretty easily so that's my envision and i think it's a it's a neat uh, things to have so i i don't think we're on the wrong path okay all right uh, klaus did you want to say something you came off me um it's just a thought that there are different degrees of interoperability. And I think we, um, so the standard so far is, is nice because uh, everybody can use the same tooling like the SDKs and so on. But with discovery and subscription, it's I think another degree of interoperability because you really can also link different infrastructures uh, at mm -hmm. some point. And I think that's just something that takes more time uh, until also the, the thinking evolves and those scenarios emerge. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll just try to shelve my worry for a little while. It's just, I, I guess, I mean, the whole KubeCon event, maybe step back and look at this because I was looking at uh, the, the charts that I put together for the KubeCon Europe, you know, it's coming up in a couple of weeks. And I was comparing it with the charts that I put together last time. And I'll be honest with you, they're basically the same charts. And that got me really worried that, you know, we've got an entire year basically, and I'm not sure we have a whole lot to show for it. And that's when I started wondering whether we're pushing on a rope. And so, but if you guys have any ideas in terms of, you know, what we can do to either speed things up or to change something to, to make things happen slightly differently, I, I'm, I'm all ears basically. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So I, I plan or I'm currently um, collecting some ideas to in increase that, that primer we started for discovery and, and subscription. Uh, in a similar way, uh, scenarios uh, Clemens already outlined in the schema registry 
uh, I think it's still a pull request, right? With the um, authorities and the different replications and, and things like this. Um, yeah, so my idea is that perhaps we then again start also discussing a bit more discovery and, and things like this. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't want to div, d d d talk anymore about this. I mean, it's just a, a kind of winding at some point, I guess. <laughs> but I just wanted to to make to find out what you guys are, are thinking about it, if at all. So thank you for that. Okay. In that case, uh, in terms of going back to the interop, then um, I guess the best we could do at this point is I'll maybe offline poke some folks. I know Clemens was supposed to be working on some stuff. I think Scott is working on some stuff. I'll poke both those folks offline to see um, how they're doing. And maybe we can quickly revisit this again on next on next week's call. Even though we don't have an interop call scheduled for next week, maybe on the main call, I'll just ask people to update their status in this page right here, just so we can see where people are. Because yeah, I think we may need a little bit of a nagging reminder for folks. So, okay. All right, any other topics you guys wanna bring up relative to interop? All right, in that case, we'll call it a day. Okay. Thanks everybody for joining and have a good weekend. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.